good morning, everybody. It's uh, certainly a pleasure for me to be here this morning. I don't know if any of you have had any chance at all this morning to appreciate this beautiful morning. It's um, this time of year that the reality hits me that sunshine in 72 isn't here forever, right? Um, it's going to get warm today, I think up to 89 is what I heard, and um, but this morning to me is absolutely perfect. I don't know if the weather's going to be like in heaven, and I think the weather in heaven may be surprising. Somebody uh, said to me uh, a while back that there will be no snow in heaven. I don't think that's true. I think there will be beautiful, beautiful snow in heaven. Um, you know, and I could be wrong. I think just as we are created in God's image, I didn't mean to get off on this tangent. I'll make, I won't make it long. Just as we have been created in God's image, I think this earth has, it'll surprise me if this earth hasn't been created in heaven's image. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the beauty on this earth, if you look at the beauty of the flowers and of the animals and of the landscape, and when you look and think of the, beautiful places that God has created on this earth, I think that's just a glimpse of what heaven will be. In other words, it will not surprise me if there's a Grand Canyon in heaven, but as, as majestic as our Grand Canyon is, I'll bet you the one in heaven is even better. I'll bet you there will be snow-capped mountains in heaven, but I bet you they'll be better than what we have here on this earth. So anyway, having said all that, it's a beautiful morning here this morning. And for me anyway, just about perfect, okay? 70s and sunshine and warm breeze, pretty good. I, I like that, all right? I can acclimate to that pretty quickly. But I also know that as we see the leaves starting to change already, as we see the crops changing, as we see the days getting shorter, I don't know if you can sense it, maybe it's my imagination, there's a little bit of a different feel to the air. Fall is coming, and we know after fall is winter, okay? And um, I'm looking forward to it, I'm embracing it. You can say, well, I don't have any choice. That's true, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 17 through 30. And we're going to be looking at three examples of Christian saints, three different examples. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, uh, his assistant Timothy, and Epaphroditus. So we're going to be looking at those. We're going to try to finish that today. I'm going to announce this here in front of you, which normally I tell Brent before I tell you. So Brent, if I think he walked out the front door, so I have to tell him. Um, Lynn and I are leaving for a vacation next week, so we'll be gone for two weeks, okay? But Brent, uh, Brent, Richard, uh, a cast of others will be here to fill in for me, and I appreciate them doing that. So we want to finish this passage today. Before we get too far along, though, I, I I think we do have to talk about COVID for a few minutes as much as I would really rather not. I wish it weren't an issue. I wish it weren't a problem. I wish it weren't important. I wish it didn't matter, but it does. And I don't know if Roger has that. Is Roger up there? No, Roger's not up here. So Jerry, do you have that cool slide thing that Roger did from the ODH last, last time? And if you don't, that's fine. Huh? I wasn't here last week. You weren't here, all right. So it's fine. Roger had put up a slide that showed all the ODH statistics. Um, and uh, if we don't have that available, that's fine. That was a surprise to me anyway. But um, the bottom line is the numbers are continuing to grow. I think yesterday reported 8,000 cases in the state of Ohio. And uh, positivity rate was up over uh, 12%, um, cases per 100,000 were almost 600, 
And you say, well, so what? What does that mean? Well, back as recently as July, the cases per 100,000 were 19. Okay, there's a big difference between 19 cases and over 600 cases. The positivity rate in July was 1.3%. And now it's up there. I don't. I. I I'll be honest. Saturday, uh, I go off the. I go off the. Uh, I go off the radar screen in terms of keeping track of the numbers during the week. I keep track of the numbers every day. So anyway, the, the bottom line is, the numbers continue continue to go up, and 8,000 cases a day certainly over the 21-day average which not long ago, the 21 day average was like 500. And then it's con continually went up. And, um, and so the experts, whoever the experts are, the epidemiologists, there's, there are experts around the country have said from the beginning, uh, or have said since this Delta wave has started that they expect it to peak sometime mid September second, third week in September. So we're still surging. The concern about that is hospitalizations and intensive care admissions and unfortunately deaths lag behind the cases. So as long as we see these case numbers go up, we can anticipate more hospitalizations, more ICU admissions, and unfortunately more deaths. This week I've had patients die from the COVID virus. I've signed death certificates this week because of the COVID virus. So it is real. It is continuing to grow. It's continuing to uh, spread at rapid, rapid rates. You've either had it or someone close to you has had it. I mean, that's just the reality, okay? Families are getting it. Now, interesting, what was it? Green County. Green County. In Green County. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Susie had the numbers here. Close to 20,000 cases in Green County and close to 300 deaths. Okay. To give you an idea. The thing that's interesting to me um, as well is we're seeing other viruses now being active as well. So now that we're testing everyone for the COVID virus, we're also testing for something called RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. That virus typically is most significant for infants, particularly newborn infants, infants less than one year of age. That virus can be deadly, but we're seeing it in adults now. Is it deadly? No, not so much. But I've had patients hospitalized this last week with RSV. So RSV is out there, okay? If you have any little ones at all or any access to little ones, chances are you've heard about hand, foot, and mouth. Hand, foot, and mouth is out there active. It's caused by a Coxsackie virus for the most part, okay? And hand, foot, and mouth is another viral illness that's out there. A couple of weeks ago, you may have heard it announced that in Clark County was the first case of West Nile virus that we've had in the area for a long time. There's been mosquitoes isolated in Greene County and Clark County positive for West Nile virus. So yet another virus that's out there, okay? Now we're studying the, the epistle of joy, and so I'm not trying to be Mr. the Grim Reaper here, okay? But there's just a lot of activity going on out there in, in healthcare. The flu vaccines are here. Okay, so I get a lot of questions about the flu vaccine and the booster. What should I do? Should I take the flu vaccine? Should I take the booster? Should I take them together? How should it be done? So the flu vaccines are here. We are giving the flu vaccines. You know, traditionally, we like to hold off until October, November to give the flu vaccine. Peak immunity, as you guys are all becoming experts at right now, is usually six to eight months. And so, you know, if you take the, the uh, flu vaccine in October and, 
in late October particularly. You're covered through the month of April. That usually covers flu season really well. Um, but people are, the boosters are coming out. In fact, Moderna, I think, is going to get it approved here soon where they're, the Moderna, where they have included the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine in the same shot. So you get one shot, you get Moderna and the flu vaccine both. So that's coming, that's on the horizon. Um, what I'm recommending is this, you can take them both together. Obviously Moderna has put them in the same shot. So you can take the flu vaccine and booster together. And if you're a convenience person and say, hey, I want the ultimate in convenience, then you know, when it's time, you can take them both at the same time if you want to. I'm more of a traditionalist in that Expose your immune system to one battle at a time, okay? For two reasons. Number one, to get the best immune response. Now, it has been argued that it doesn't make any difference, and I understand that. But still, common sense tells me that if you expose your immune system to one thing at a time, the immune system responds accordingly. And so what I've been recommending to patients is Yes, if you're a candidate for the flu vaccine, and most everybody is, get the flu vaccine. Okay, you can get it now, or you can get it no later than early November. Okay, you can get it later than that. We give people a flu vaccine in December and January, but um, ideally, between now and sometime, you know, the next six weeks is an ideal time to get the flu vaccine. When your time comes up for the booster, and by the way, they've not approved the booster yet. They're meeting this Friday, Friday, I think the 17th, whatever day that is, I think it's Friday. The FDA is meeting to make a final decision about the booster, even though we think it's a done deal, and I think it probably is a done deal, it's not been formally approved or announced yet. I anticipate they're going to formally approve and announce a booster for the COVID vaccine. If it were me, and it is going to be me, I, I'm mandated, I have to take the flu shot. I don't have to take the booster, but I would separate them by two weeks at least. If you want to separate them by a month, that's fine, six weeks, but a minimum of two weeks I would separate them. Just kind of allow your, your immune system to do one thing at a time, okay, and, and optimize the benefit, all right? So that's a question I get asked a lot about, about the flu vaccine and about the booster. And of course, there's lots of other vaccines out there, the Pneumovax, two pneumonia shots, shingle shots, lots of vaccines. And my recommendation is the same, whether it's a shingles vaccine or the pneumonia vaccine or whatever vaccine is separate, <clears throat> keep them separate and allow your immune system to respond to one, one insult at a time. I guess the last thing is, is uh, variants. <clears throat> there's talk about variants. There's two Delta variants, or there's, there's a Delta variant out there, the Delta Plus <clears throat> that we've mentioned before. And then there's the Mu variant. Right now, not a lot of information about both either, either of them. The Delta Plus does not look to be as contagious as the Delta. And so with that in mind, it's not, we don't think it's gonna be a big deal. The mu, mu variant, we don't know yet. They're still studying it, there's not enough. It has been isolated in Ohio, okay? Ohio State's kind of the leader that keeps track of such things, and the mu variant is here in Ohio, okay? Jury's still out on that. Okay. Oh, there you go. Good job, guys. Okay. Those are the indicators there, 8,400 cases over the last 24 hours. This is the state of Ohio, 1.3 million reported cases. This is updated as of 9-11 yesterday. And you can see that the 21-day average of 5,400, the last 24 hours is higher than the last three weeks, so it's going up. Hospitalizations, uh, last 24 hours, uh, is down a little bit from the 21 day average. ICU admissions is up over the 21 day average. Deaths, that death number is, um, they don't report deaths every day. They don't report deaths over the weekend. So 
them reporting deaths and 20 over the weekend of zero means nothing. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything because they haven't they don't report. Okay, they report when the death certificates are recorded and they're not recorded over the weekend. So that's how that works. <clears throat> so when you see zero deaths, you think great. Mm, it's not true. It's not a true number. Okay, so that gives you uh, an idea of where things are the latest on the uh, on the COVID situation. As I said, the reported cases or confirmed cases, those aren't reported, those are confirmed. Those are positive tests, okay? 8,400 over the last 24 hours, okay? So that's where we are, where we've been over the last 21 days, okay? Any questions? Any comments? No? Okay. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. And I should say real quickly, the people that are, there are people watching that aren't in the state of Ohio. Those are for Ohio. Is, are we an island out there? No. Uh, Kentucky is reporting the highest cases they've had. Kentucky's activated the National Guard to help at the hospitals because their hospitals are overwhelmed in Kentucky. They said the ICUs are overwhelmed in Kentucky. And so um, we're not to that point yet in Ohio, but we are getting close. I mean. As, as those numbers go up, when we see that 8,400, we know that in the next 10 days, hospital rates are going to go up because of that, okay? The more confirmed cases, the more hospitalizations, the, you know, it just all goes downstream. And it lags by days, okay? So as long as we see those confirmed cases going up, we know that the other is going, that hospitalizations and ICU admissions are going to follow. Okay, so let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 through uh, 30. And we have spent verses 17 and 18, and we spent a lot of time, and maybe too much time, I don't know. But we spent a lot of time talking about the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, we see this, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Okay, Paul is referring to himself being poured out as a sacrifice. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the Apostle Paul. In my opinion, there is no one other than Jesus Christ himself, that we should emulate more than the Apostle Paul. In other words, I don't think anyone is any better than anybody else, but if, I, if you were to ask me which man walked this earth closest to the footsteps of Jesus Christ, I would say the Apostle Paul. The other apostles were great. They were, and, and, and disciples and godly men and women through the ages, untold numbers. But the Apostle Paul ranks right up there at the top in my mind. And so we spent a lot of time talking about the Apostle Paul. Now, before we go on to Timothy and Epaphroditus, I want to pause just for one minute. If you are watching or listening, you have a prayer request or need or a comment or anything that we can help you with, Jerry is up there in the booth monitoring. We're going to have a time of prayer after the lesson. So keep that in mind. So. In verses 17 through 18, this passage talks about the Apostle Paul, or very briefly, Paul mentions very briefly, and it's interesting, only two verses Paul refers to himself, but he does refer to himself. And we talked about the Apostle Paul. So now we're going to look at the second Christian service, or servant, in Timothy, okay? Verses 19 through 24 talk about Timothy. Let's read this. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me, 
but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. So the Apostle Paul, talking to the Philippians here, says that I am being poured out as a drink offering for you each and every day. And I'm going to send my servant Timothy to you. Okay? Timothy, as I said a minute ago, there's no one that I know of that more closely emulated Jesus Christ than Paul. There's no one that I know of that more closely emulated Paul than Timothy. Paul tells us right here, trust the Lord Jesus sent Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, for I have no one. Paul says himself, there is no one any more like-minded to me, to Paul, than Timothy. Timothy gives us a second trustworthy example to emulate. It's interesting to look at Timothy. Timothy was from Lystra, which was modern Turkey. So Timothy wasn't from Jerusalem. Timothy didn't walk the same paths that Jesus walked. Timothy was from an outlying area. Timothy's mother, Eunice, was a Jew. And Timothy's father, who was not named, but we know is a Greek. And as a Greek, we feel like that he was probably a pagan. And the reason is, uh, there's a couple, there's several reasons that theologians feel like that Timothy's father was a Greek pagan. One big reason is Timothy was trained in the Greek traditions, the Greek ways, and Timothy was never circumcised as a child. His mother would have had him circumcised but Timothy was not, which was the Greek way, the pagan way, in the Jews' eyes, okay? And so Timothy, being both Greek and Jew, uniquely positioned him for service. He could talk smack with the Gentiles. He could talk smack with the Jews. It's pretty good, right? He knew both ways. He was familiar with both cultures. He was familiar with their attitudes. He was familiar with how people operated. Okay? That put him in a unique position for service. Timothy was led to Christ during Paul's first missionary journey. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4.17. First Corinthians 4, 17 says this, for this reason I've sent Timothy to you who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul's telling the Corinthians that Timothy is his beloved and faithful son in the Lord. As I said, his mother and grandmother were Jewish believers and we know that they were instrumental in teaching Timothy. If you look at second Timothy, Chapter 3, verse 15. Second Timothy 3, 15 says that. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy's mother and grandmother did a great job preparing him. You know, we all know the basic premise that the Lord will never ask of us more than he's prepared for us to do. He'll never put more on us than what we can bear, what we can handle. My point here is Timothy was a special individual in terms of his upbringing, of his heritage. He was chosen by God to be Paul's right-hand man and a perfect right-hand man. For Paul, a son in the faith. Paul describes Timothy in several different ways. He describes him as a child in the faith. We've seen that. Paul describes him as his son. We just read that in 1 Corinthians. Paul describes him as a fellow worker. Look at Romans 16.21. Romans 
Romans 16, 21 says, Timothy, my fellow worker. Okay. Paul describes him as a brother in 2 Corinthians 1, 1. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, a brother in the Lord. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul describes Timothy as a fellow bondservant. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. And we know what a bondservant was. A bondservant was a special designation. You know, if you were a servant, there was always an opportunity for you to be given freedom. A bond servant was committed to service for life without parole. No chance of freedom. No chance of leading a life separate than from service to the master. So Paul, a child in the faith, a fellow worker, a brother, a bond servant to Paul, had a special place. Paul says like no other in this passage. Now. It's, it's known to be true that Timothy, by the time this letter was written, had served side by side with Paul for 10 years. When you work side by side with somebody for 10 years, you know them pretty well. Paul had complete confidence in Timothy, complete confidence. And Paul, uh, in this passage, outlines seven characteristics of Timothy. Okay, and we'll go through those quickly. We won't. I'll try not to get bogged down in these. The first characteristic was Paul was Timothy's spiritual character. In verse nineteen, Paul says, "But I trust the Lord Jesus and Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state." Verse twenty: For I have no one like-minded. No one. Paul knew Timothy. He knew Timothy's heart. He knew Timothy's mind. He knew that Timothy was very similar in his thinking and in his convictions and in his attitudes as Paul. He was a true kindred spirit with Paul. There was no one else of Timothy's stature, as Paul tells us right here. I have no one like Timothy. Timothy truly held a special place and a special stature. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, Verses 16 and 17 says this. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. If you wanted to see the Apostle Paul, all you had to do is look at Timothy. If you wanted to know what Paul thought about something, ask Timothy. If you wanted to see how Paul would respond to something, ask Timothy. There was no one more like the Apostle Paul than Timothy. Just as I said a minute ago, there was no one on earth more like Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul. During the time of the Apostle Paul's life, if the Apostle Paul was alive right now, if he walked in right here and sat down in this church, and I believe he would sit in the front, not the back, that's my guess. But wherever Paul would come in, Okay. If you wanted to know what Jesus thought, ask the Apostle Paul. If you want to know what Jesus would do, ask the Apostle Paul. There was no one closer to our Savior than the Apostle Paul. Okay. We know he spent direct one-on-one -on -one time with him. We know that he conversed with him. We know that he took field trips to heaven. Okay. So Timothy was similar to Paul. Number two, Timothy was sympathetic. Just as the Apostle Paul had concerns, continual concerns for believers and their welfare, Timothy had concerns, okay? I have no one like-minded will sincerely, who will sincerely care for your state. Timothy cared. 
you guys have heard me say this before, as a physician, patients really don't care what you know until they know that you care. It's more important to them that you care than if you know. Okay? Timothy cared. He was sympathetic, just like the Apostle Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 28. 2 Corinthians 11, 28 says this. Besides other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Timothy was like-minded. He cared. He was sympathetic. Number two, he was single-minded. Paul records later in some passages that virtually when Paul was in prison and Paul, the heat got hot, hot, hot on the apostle Paul. Those around him dissipated. They disappeared. Except for Timothy. Okay? Except for Timothy. Timothy was seasoned. Let's look here. Okay, well, let's look in verse 21 when we talk about being still like-minded and, and committed. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. All seek their own, not Christ. Except Timothy. Paul. Verse 22, you know his proven character. Timothy was seasoned. Timothy was a known commodity. Like I said a minute ago, he'd been with Paul for over 10 years by this point in time. He proved himself. He proved himself. He proved himself not only to Paul, but he proved himself to the churches. And in this case, the Philippians. Timothy was a known commodity. He was proven. Again and again and again. Okay? The Philippians knew, and we should know, we're not to take things at face value. We're to test the spirits. Look at Romans 12, too. Romans 12, chapter 2 says this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to prove. We are to be discerning. And we need to know that God is discerning for us. He tests us. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says this. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Timothy was proven. He was not only proved by the Apostle Paul, but more importantly, he was proven by God. He was tested. He was seasoned. Timothy was submissive. Yes, he was submissive to the Apostle Paul, but more importantly, Timothy was submissive to the Lord. Verse 22 says, But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. This may be a revelation to you. I don't know. I doubt it. Fathers and sons don't always get along. Right? Brothers don't always get along. Co-workers don't always be, get along. And we've talked about this before in our studies. In order for there to be unity, in order for us to get along, there has to be what? Anybody remember? There has to be humility to be unity. I don't care who it is. I mentioned a minute ago my perfect temperature. Right now, I've got a long sleeve shirt on, I've got a jacket on, the temperature in this room feels pretty good to me. But I'm sure if we were to take a poll, for some of you, it is burning up. It's like an inferno in here. It's hot. Some of you are freezing to death. You're chattering. Okay? But yet we're all here because we're willing to put the needs or the desires of others above our own. That's how we get along. Timothy was willing to put his put service to the Lord. And he was willing not only to submit to the Lord, but he was willing to submit to his senior elder, apostle, Paul. So Timothy was submissive. 
He did not serve Paul, but he served with Paul. Both were bond servants. We read that in Philippians 1.1. Timothy served. In whatever area he was called to serve, he submitted to that service. Number six, Timothy was sacrificial. Okay? Therefore, I hope to send him at once until it goes with me, until I see how it goes with me. He was sacrificial. And then last and certainly not least, Timothy was available. Timothy was available. He was willing and he was available to go. When we look at the attributes of Christian service, if we look in this passage, verses 19 through 24, we see the keys to us being the men and women that God has called us to be. We need to be like-minded. We need to be sympathetic. We need to care. We need to be single-minded in what we do. We need to be proven. We need to submit and be submissive. We need to be willing to sacrifice. And last, but certainly not least, probably even most importantly, we need to be available. I have medical students that work with me. I have medical students and residents. We also have young providers that we bring in. And I tell them the three A's of success to being a, a care provider and caring for people. There are three things. And they may not be the three things that you think, but they're in this order. Number one, you have to be available. Number two, you have to be affable. And number three, you have to be able. Now, you would think in choosing a health care provider that ability would be number one. It's not. Availability is number one. So I tell people that if you want to be successful in medicine, you have to do three things. You have to answer the phone when it rings. You have to be nice when you do it. And you have to be fairly competent in what you do. And if you can do those three things, you'll be wildly successful. You answer the telephone, you're nice when you do it, and you're capable in what you do. Okay? So Timothy sets the example, the Apostle Paul. Betty waved at me, right? Did you wave at me? Okay. I want to make sure you just didn't have an itch or something. Anyway. The next servant here in verses 25 through 30 is Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is totally different than Paul and Timothy. Okay? And we're going to, we'll talk about Epaphroditus. I wanted to get finished today and didn't do it. But we can talk briefly about Epaphroditus now. And then when I come back in two weeks, we will go on to a new topic. Epaphroditus is referred to as a loving gambler. Epaphroditus, the name, means one who belongs to Epaphrodite or Venus, which is the goddess of love. It went on in that culture to mean lovely or beautiful. Epaphroditus is described as a loving gambler. Epaphroditus, again, was trained as a Greek in pagan ways. He knew the ways of the world, which came in handy because he was a messenger. He carried messages from the Philippian church to Paul and back and forth. The Philippians loved him and they trusted him, or else they wouldn't have given him that role to carry gifts and letters and, and material of significant importance. Remember, when you traveled back in that day, it wasn't like we travel now. It was by foot, and there was danger at every turn. Epaphroditus was good at what he did, which means he was somewhat of a character. He could handle himself. Okay? He could probably handle himself physically, but he could also handle himself with all kinds of situations. He was very well versed in the ways of the world. And he was very well liked. He was very, he was loved by the Philippians and he was loved by the Apostle Paul, both. He was a messenger and he was a minister. He ministered to the Philippians, he ministered to the Apostle Paul. Okay? You don't see anything recorded in scripture great that he did. You don't receive, you know, he is not lifted up as being a major saint, this was a guy who did his job every day, which makes him relevant to me and to you. 
You know, when you think about walking in the Apostle Paul's shoes, those are big shoes to fill. Timothy, big shoes to fill. Epaphroditus, he's a guy just like me and just like you. Okay? He's relevant in his service. He had no public acclaim, no prominence, no high office, no great talents, no great gifts. He was not a noted preacher, not a teacher, not a leader. But his example is probably more relevant and attainable to all of us than Paul or Timothy. He was willing to help as needed. He had great courage to do what he did. He took great risk. That's why he's a gambler. Paul described him very quickly in verse 25. Paul described him. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and minister. He had a very close relationship with Paul. They had common goals. They had common struggles. He carried the message. Epaphroditus was one cool dude. And they loved him. Okay? And he served. So in this passage, verses 17 through 30, we see three very different leaders. Paul, the bold and the fearless. Timothy, the quiet and the devoted. Epaphroditus, the diligent. The guy behind the scenes who didn't get a lot of fanfare, didn't get a lot of prominence, took great risk, risked his own life. And we see, if you read in verses 26 through 30, nearly lost his life in his service. I look forward to meeting all three and spending time with all three. Three servants, three very different leaders, all three to be emulated. Now all three set examples for us today in our Christian walk. All three lives worth imitating. Okay, we'll pick up from there when I'm back. Any prayer requests, Jerry? No? Got it, okay. All right, we're gonna pray anyway. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and we thank you for the examples that are set before us. Today we studied just three servants and we know that your word is full of examples for us to live by, to emulate. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the devoted Timothy. We thank you for the loving Epaphroditus. We thank you for all three and pray that you would help us to learn from them and to grow in our walk to be the men and women that you've called us to be, to be the salt and the light, to make a difference in this world, which needs you more than ever. Pray that you would help us to be bold and fearless like Paul, to be devoted like Timothy, and to be committed like Epaphroditus. Pray that you would help us in our daily walk. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve and help us to realize and recognize that the best way to serve you is to serve those around us, Help us to see opportunities to reach out and make a difference, knowing that it's the little things that sometimes have the biggest impact. Help us not to overlook or miss the opportunities that you've given us. Help us to stay single-minded and sympathetic and sacrificial in what we do. Help us to stay focused on you. Help us to draw closer to you each and every day because we know that the more we become like you, the more effective we become. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. We thank you for the hope that we have eternal. We thank you that our best days are ahead. They're not behind us, they're ahead of us. And we embrace that. We look forward to tomorrow. We look forward ultimately to being in your presence and spending eternity with you. We thank you for all that you've done for us and the security that we have in our salvation and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that you've given. Pray that you would be exalted above all today and every day. It's in your name, in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.